ask the Lord's blessing on his word. Lord, we thank you for your word today. For Lord, your word is truly truth and life to us. Let the anointing of your word be on every ear and every heart in this room, that your word might come alive to us. We bless you and honor you, that we might learn to use it when we need it the most in our lives. We ask this in your precious name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Today, we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You know, when you read that story and you, and you remember what it said, you know, it seems such, like, such a glorious moment in the life of Christ. The entire city of Jerusalem had come out and they were laying down uh, palm branches and they were actually proclaiming the coming of their king. But it wasn't that much longer afterwards that they were yelling, crucify him. So I'm going to read a small excerpt from this, and then we're going to go into it. On the next day, much people that were, had come, this is from John chapter 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat therein as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass of a colt. Those things understood not his disciples at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered that, they, that these things were written of him that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. It's funny, when you read the Gospel of John, there's times when he actually interrupts the narrative. And this is one of those times. Listen to what he says. They're talking about the fulfillment of Scripture. These are the things understood, not the disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they those things which were written of him, that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. Almost like John is acting like a good lawyer. Wait a minute. There were witnesses to this narrative. Something is taking place that is very, very important. And then he goes on with the narrative again. Why? Why in the world would God point out the resurrection of Lazarus when they're remembering what happened to him on the triumphal entry? You and I in our lives, we come to a place in our lives where where there is something that takes place within us that is so important, that is so profound from within, it can change your life. What are those things in our lives that causes us to come into that point where we're seeking God in our life and all of a sudden, within us, there's a change? That there is a way that God works in our life that causes us to wake up. Because that's what was happening here when we read what John is penning. He's saying that something very important is happening here. And it's happening, and the same people that witnessed it also witnessed the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And it's that raising of Lazarus from the dead that causes us, when we see this happen, if you remember it, it was very profound. 
I mean, could you imagine being there at that moment of time when Lazarus was risen from the dead? You remember Mary and Martha, they said, well, Jesus, if you'd come a little earlier. <laughs> and then Jesus goes to the grave site. And at the grave site, he says, Father, I thank you that you hear me, that you always hear me. But for the people, he's saying this. Lazarus, come forth. And what happens? Lazarus, who was dead, and they proclaim that he stinketh. <laughs> he comes out of the grave with his grave clothes on, alive. This week, we celebrate the holiest week of the year. The narrative of your life needs to stop. You and I need to recognize within ourselves that we are living in death. But when Jesus comes into your life, he takes what is from within you and he rises it up again because the gospels teach us that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also raise you. Amen. So you have an opportunity this week to have life. I'm going to share with you something that happened to me this past week. In my prayer time, the Lord showed me two bugs. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when he does that. <laughs> Basically, you know, he was teaching us that you can either be the honeybee or you can be the fly. You decide. So I started to think about the honeybee and the fly. The honeybee, what does it do? It goes out and it collects nectar, doesn't it? And then it takes that nectar and it puts it into its stomach, all right? And there's enzymes inside of a honeybee that work on that nectar, and then it regurgitates it into the honey, into the hive, right? For what? For the future generations, so that they can eat and have honey. And the honey is what? It's a symbol of the Word of God. Then I thought to myself, well, what about the fly? <laughs> Flies are a pain. I have one flying around my room right now in my office. <laughs> he says, or you can be like the fly. And the fly gets its sustenance from death. It procures its future by planting its larva, or it's whatever they call those little things, inside the carcass of a dead animal. You decide, if you want the Word of God to become alive in your life, then you have to begin to search out the flowers of life and pull from those flowers the nectar. And remember, it's not for you. It's for the next generation. And then, the Lord showed me, I don't have one here. Oh, we do have one here. This here. Everybody knows what that is, right? It's a tzitzit. And we've all been taught that it reminds us of the 613 laws. But did you know that the tzitzit, in the original Hebrew mindset, was not about keeping law. It was about reaching potential. Because the cognate of the word for a tzitzit is a blossom. If you go to the blossoms and collect the nectar 
of the kingdom of God and you begin to store it within yourself, the enzymes of your life will begin to work on that and when you begin to bring it out, it will be stored for the future generations. So when an ancient Hebrew looked at a tzitzit, it was looking at when you keep my covenant, it will be like you are collecting nectar for the future. What are we doing? When Jesus comes to us on the holiest week of the year and he enters into Jerusalem riding on a cult of an ass, he is facing death. And we are proclaiming that he is king. But it wasn't that much longer when they yelled, have him crucified. So we see the story and we wonder to ourselves the contrast of these things happening. How do I begin to put this in my life? If you read about Samson, he talks about a story of a lion. Everybody know the story of the lion? And inside the mouth of a lion was a honeycomb. And the reason why he tells that story is because he's showing us that in, the, in death, those things that we are afraid of in life, those things that are bringing us down, the things that are actually tearing down within us, our ability to live and to move and have our being inside of that mouth of a lion that roars to scare you is the honey. Jesus did not say, well, I don't think it's a really good idea for me to go to Jerusalem this week. <laughs> How many times in your life have you said that to yourself when you are facing the mouth of a lion? All of us have, if we're honest. And so, God wants to reignite within you the ability to go out and to collect the nectar of life in the midst of the trials and tribulations. It's the things that bring you down that God is going to use to raise you up. And so do not shy away, but ask God to allow you to come. How did Jesus enter into Jerusalem? It says a cult of an ass, a beast of burden. And when they waved these branches down and they put them at his feet, they were prophetically proclaiming. It is a symbol of the prophetic word of God. What is the prophetic word of God? Believing those things that are not as if they were. That is prophetic. And so when you're going to begin in your life that journey, when God Almighty has come within you and you realize, Jesus is Lord. Lord. He's alive. Life has a way of taking that moment of time and beginning to tear it down. Mm -hmm. The problems of life begin to tell you, you hear the roar louder than the honey that is in the mouth of the dead lion. So instead, when the power of the resurrection comes in your life, God is going to take those things that are part of death because he has positioned you like the honeybee to collect the nectar of life so that when you meditate on his word, when your enzymes begin to work on it inside of you, you begin to have life. You have life within you. And that life is preserved for the future. In Hebrew mindset, they don't even have a concept for past, present, and future. Did you know that? Even the Hopi Indians don't even understand what that means. If you ever want to understand it, you can go to Jeff Brennan <laughs> on YouTube, by the way, just giving you a place to go. <laughs> they only understand present action and future action. 
It's not based on, in our Greek mindset, we think of past, present, and future. <coughs> it's an action. The scriptures are actually built to teach us the actions. It's the actions of Christ in your life that is not something that happened in the past. It should be happening to you right now. When you have that knowing that God is with you and that you don't have to sit here and suffer because of the sake of suffering, you are now coming into a place in your life where you are receiving life from the very blossoms of life. You are looking at the word of God instead of saying, man, I don't know if I can do that. That seems really hard. You are an attitude of, I know that God is able to do all things. Amen. That nothing is impossible for him. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so you now look at the things of God and you see life in them. That is what it means to collect the nectar of life. Not to look at your past and go, well, I really screwed up for the last few years. No, the word of God says that today is the day of salvation. Reach out today and begin to collect the honey. Well, Fali, you're certainly spiritualizing everything. I am. <laughs> is it easy? No, but it's a discipline. And it's really learning to look at things in a different way. Glory. We look at the trials of our lives. The word of God says that the purpose of our lives is to fulfill God's word in every one of us. And if you are going to go into Jerusalem, the reason why Jesus was on a cult of an ass was he was going to fulfill the purpose of his life. And that was your salvation. If he didn't enter into Jerusalem triumphantly and the disciples who recognized what was happening in that triumphal entry, they said, the ones that were with Jesus at the raising of Lazarus. Death, where is your sting? It cannot hold you down. If you die, you yet shall you live. Why? Because you are no longer feeding off the carcasses of life. You are feeding from the nectar of the word of God. And you are preserving it by meditating on that word. When I was in Israel, I kept asking the store place, can I get one of these with a blue string? <laughs> How many like escargot? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if it's related, but it's a snail. <laughs> and it's called a, I can't say it, but a mass something snail that produces this special bluish purple dye. Do you know that that purple dye comes from a snail which is unkosher? <laughs> and they meditate on that color inside of it because it is a symbol of the heavenly realm of the kingdom of God and when you meditate that it's mixed in with the white tzitzit which is a blossom everybody's catching this they use snails to make a dye it's put into one string of each corner of the tzitzit and you meditate, it says they teach you, the Jews, to meditate on that one color because it reminds you of the kingdom of God. And so a kosher guy, if you look at a Jew, a kosher Jew, you will see that he has his teat seat wearing, and he has each corner, he'll have one purplish string in the middle. Of course, the lady said, You have to get that one special, it's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, do you know that the honeybee is not kosher either? And yet it carries that which is kosher. You, in your life and in my life, will find ourselves always in a place of not being kosher. But yet, if you are 
going after that nectar. How many of us in this room have given up going to the nectar and living off of death, off of negativity, off of problems? We like them. In fact, it energizes us because we might think that we're better than somebody else. And yet, in our life, he is taking that which is not and he's making it holy from within. He's done that for you when he went to the cross. The entire game changes when Jesus goes to the cross and he rises from the dead. He takes you and me who had no hope of salvation. We were dead, just like the prodigal son. Son, your brother was dead, but he's alive again. You were dead in your sins, but because of the power of the death and resurrection of Christ, you are alive again. And he's teaching us to go to the nectar of life. So this week, in the midst of the lore of all the problems of life, as life begins to tear you down, you look to the cross. And when you see those little vipers biting you because you have been living in death, the little he, God it raises up a seraph on a cross, and all who look upon it will be saved. Look to the word of God. That cult of an ass rode the word of God into the holy city. The people delivered him the word onto a cross. He is the word of God. If we would look to him, you would receive the nectar as you meditate, as you muse upon his word. But what does that meditation and musing have to do? If you are the blossom, it has to produce fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a blossom that didn't produce fruit? Well, a cherry blossom, right now they're blooming in China. <laughs> right, they're beautiful. I think probably pretty soon in Washington, D.C., you'll see them blooming, right? And they produce cherries, don't they? Produce fruit. That means that if you truly have had that encounter in your life and you are seeking that nectar, you will produce fruit. And that fruit not only will be, you will, you will get it from the, from the blossom, but you also preserve it for future generations. So bless God today. Let his word come alive in your life as we celebrate the triumphal entry into Jerusalem of the Word who became flesh, who dwelt among us, was crucified, died, went into death, and he rose again for you. Amen. And may the Lord add a blessing to his Word. We thank you for your Word this day. For Lord, your Word is truly truth to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have made a way for us. And this week, Lord, we, as a congregation, are going to drink from the honey. We are going to drink from the nectar of the blossom of your word in our life so that we could not only, not only receive the life within us, but for future generations. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Amen.